everybody. We are taking a look at the last chapter in the textbook, looking at substance abuse, alcohol, and crime. So first, let's talk about juvenile drug use. <clears throat> widely looked at as one of the most important social concerns that we have in our country. When you look at the statistics, overall use is going down or at least leveling off, depending on the survey that you look at. 8.8% of adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 have used drugs or alcohol, 21.5% of young adults between the ages of 18 and 25. And when we look at drug use, marijuana is the most common. Um, it is associated with health problems, deviant behavior, high risk behaviors, poor academic performance, addiction, and even death from overdose or car accidents. Um, marijuana, again, increasing a 2012 survey showed an increase of 80% among young people. Um, and, and, and that was between 2008 and 2012. And um, about half of all of the juveniles that were surveyed reported using marijuana. And we probably have seen that go even higher because we've had a lot of the laws and the social perception of marijuana use has changed. Males do report higher uh, rates of use of alcohol and drugs than females do when doing surveys um, with juveniles. Now, there has been some, some research that suggests that pathway to substance abuse um, is, uh, is having some of those risk factors that we've already talked about, some of those early risk factors like peer rejection, um, hanging out with uh, antisocial peers or with peers that view drug and alcohol use as kind of the group norm. Um, also, uh, con uh, there's a correlation between drug and alcohol use and conduct pro problems and even conduct disorder, antisocial behavior, and uh, with uh, low parental monitoring. And we've talked about parenting styles and parenting, monitor uh, parent parenting monitoring in a previous chapter. So again, a lot of health problems are associated with it. Um, Addiction issues, definitely, uh, those high-risk behaviors, poor academic relationships, uh, performance, um, and then, of course, what I was talking about with serious health problems and even death from overdose or car accidents. The FBI data report that uh, most of the arrest of juveniles are for the possession of drugs. J juveniles typically don't get through, don't get involved in the selling of drugs or any of that, the business side of drug use. It's, it's usually the use or possession of drugs. Um, that includes things like heroin and cocaine, marijuana, synthetic narcotics, and um, other dangerous narcotic drugs, and, and prescription drugs as well, um, like prescription opiates. So who is selling drugs to juveniles? Other students that are hired by older dealers, gang members, of course, drug dealers. Um, and I mentioned that males report, uh, juvenile males report using more often than females um, and in higher quantities. All right, some consistent findings on illicit drug use. The, uh, the uh, and, and by the way, research on drugs finds the relationship between drugs and crimes can be looked at through kind of two, these two different perspectives. So the first is looking at the use, sell, and manufacturing, distri distribution, and possession of illegal drugs, um, it's kind of the business side of drugs. And then <clears throat> on the side of the psychological and pharmacological effects that certain drugs have on users' behaviors <clears throat> that can promote criminal actions. So we got the business side of it in terms of uh, illegal activity, and then how the substances affect people that can promote criminal behavior. Some consistent findings on drug use. Um, using these two perspectives, research has come to the following conclusions and, uh, and consistent findings on drug use. More individuals are incarcerated or held in jails and prisons for drug offenses than any other offense. And this has contributed to um, our overpopulation in both our jails and our prisons. Um, <clears throat> that is due in large part to a lot of the changes in sentencing laws. So we have um, longer sentences for the possession and use and sale of some drugs 
um, and, uh, and more people being arrested and prosecuted for these crimes. In 2010, 1.3 million people were arrested for drug violations, another 396,000 for liquor law offenses. State courts um, in that year saw 195,000 cases for drug trafficking. In 2002, a quarter of all jail inmates convicted of, were convicted of drug-related offenses. We do have drug courts that help to reduce the burden on the criminal court system. And actually, drug courts show better recidivism rates, um, about 18 to 20 percent fewer rearrest, because drug courts tend to offer um, treatment options as opposed to jail. As I mentioned, um, a lot of arrestees, uh, a lot of uh, people who are arrested are arrested for drug-related offenses. And they've done a lot of testing of people when they're arrested to see if they are testing positive for drugs. So a 2010 testing program found that 52% to 80% of arrestees either tested positive for drugs or reported themselves in self-report surveys drug use. Of those, 49% um, were for marijuana, 11 to 37% for cocaine, and 2 to 18% for heroin. That, that study was done in 2010. Ten years later, with the problems that we have in our country with opioids, I would venture to guess that heroin and other opioids would rank much higher today if we were testing people for those drugs. Um, in 2004, one third to a quarter of all federal prisoners committed their crime while under the influence. Um, so we have a lot of arrestees and incarcerated offenders who um, either report that they were under the influence or they were tested when they came in. Um, some offenders commit crimes to support drug habits. Some criminal groups have specific drug preferences. Um, some offenders commit property crimes to support their drug habit. 17% of state prisoners and 18% of federal prisoners said they committed their current offense to obtain money for drugs. That was in 2004. Um, drug trafficking, and that's kind of the business side of drugs, often uh, ends, it really ends in violence, and it really just kind of it's just a violent business. So drug trafficking often involves violent crimes. Um, that can include things like t t t t territorial disputes, gang violence, violence between the buyers and the seller sellers. Drugs are a valuable commodity. It's big money. And when you have big money, weapons, uh, people who are used to violence, it really equals a volatile mix for the potential of violence when you look at the business side of drug trafficking. The drug, the drug crime relationship is difficult to identify and measure, um, and it's and it's really complex. The relationship between drugs and con crime is complicated by a lot of different interactions. So, number one, the the pharmacological effects of drugs on the brain and body. Um, number two, the psychological characteristics of the specific drug that is being taken the psychological conditions under which the drug is being taken, and the interaction that drugs have on each other. Um, every person reacts differently to different drugs, and it depends on the amount of the drug that is taken, whether or not it's mixed with alcohol, whether that person um, is used to taking drugs, what is their mental health status when they take drugs. Um, there are a lot of different, uh, different factors that play a role on how a specific drug is going to um, affect a particular person and how that person might behave while they're on drugs. Paul Goldstein created the uh, this model that was created in 1985, which is was designed to help us to understand the drug crime relationship. Um, so psychopharmacologically driven, uh, this are some people commit crimes and even violent acts because drugs cause them to. Without drugs, there would be no crime, according to this model. The second is systematic crime. Systematic crime crimes arise out of the business of drugs like trafficking and distribution. And three, economically compulsive criminal behavior that supports an expensive drug habit like robbery and theft. So this basically says there are three types of crimes that are associated with drug use. 
people react in, in ways that they wouldn't otherwise react because they are on drugs. We have the business of drugs, and then we have people that are addicted who engage in criminal behavior to uh, to to buy drugs to to feed that addiction that they have. So when we look at the uh, major categories of drugs, first of all, psychoactive drug is any chemical substance that influences a person's mood, their perception, their mode of thinking, their behavior. That can ensure, include um, drugs, alcohol, controlled substances, um, uh, prescription substances. I mean, there are a lot of different drugs. So hallucinogens are things like marijuana, PCP, and acid. Stimulants are drugs that stimulate the central nervous system. Uh, coffee and nicotine are two legal stimulants that a lot of people use. Um, in fact, coffee is the um, most widely used uh, psychoactive drug in the world. Um, but then we also have drugs like meth, amphetamines, and cocaine, which are also stimulants. We have sedatives, which are uh, hypnotics, um, and they depress the central nervous system. Um, Anything that depresses the central nervous system, by the way, has a you know pretty high risk of overdosing because if you suppress um, all of your automatic um, responses like your breathing and respiration, um, that increases the risk of um, of overdose and even death. That includes things like alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant, um, and benzodiazepines. Uh, like Valium. And then we have opiates, which are sleep-inducing medications, pain medications. Uh, heroin would be an example of a um, illegal narcotic. And then, of course, we have a lot of pain medication, a lot of opiate pain medication. We have a big problem in this country with people who are addicted to opiate pain medications. Some terms that go along with drug use and abuse tolerance. Um, the individual requires a larger dose of the drug to reach the same effects. When you first start taking drugs or even drinking alcohol, um, you feel a certain effect. And then if you keep taking that drug you or keep drinking, you develop tolerance and you need more and more and more of that in larger doses to feel that same effect. Um, and the person becomes uh, physiologically uh, habituated or addicted to the drug and psychologically habituated to the drug. Um, a lot of people start using drugs and alcohol because they have other issues going on. Um, they have pain, they have trauma, they have, you know, issues in their life and they take drugs or alcohol and that pain is gone and, and they don't think about all of those things and, and, and they continue taking it. And that's how they become both physically and psychologically addicted and habituated to drugs. So that's really what dependence is. You have physical dependence, psychological dependence. Most people actually have both. And that's what addiction is being, um, you know, physically or psychologically dependent on drugs or alcohol. So the hallucinogens, um, I mentioned that that includes marijuana, um, and it, it's a tricky one because marijuana is legal in a lot of states. Um, THC is the uh, is the chemical compound in marijuana. Um, salvia is another plant that has kind of similar properties as marijuana. Marijuana does come, you know, from a plant, as most of you probably know. Um, when it comes to addiction, there's no solid evidence to indicate that cannabis contributes uh, to addiction and no real evidence that it's one of those drugs that encourages violent or property crime. It does, however, uh, diminish your psychomotor performance, um, uh, lowers your response time. Uh, it can increase risk-taking behavior. There's some people that suggest marijuana is um, a gateway drug where people who take marijuana are more likely to take other drugs. Um, research is really kind of 50-50 on whether or not that is true. But what's interesting about marijuana, again, is that it's legal in a lot of states and that 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 most research suggests um, that there are not a lot of addictive properties to uh, marijuana, like we would see with something like methamphetamine or with something like heroin. Um, there are other hallucinogens that are out there, uh, PCP, um, acid. Uh, most people that use these types of uh, hallucinogens tend to be polydrug users, meaning that they don't just use 
uh, acid or PCP or marijuana, they tend to use other drugs as well. Amphetamines, um, there are prescription amphetamines like benzodrine, dexedrine, um, which have been prescribed in the past um, for diet pills. And then of course we have methamphetamine, which is a man-made drug, which is incredibly dangerous. If you haven't seen the faces of meth, Google it. Um, meth is one of those drugs that really just wreaks havoc on the body and the brain, by the way. There are studies that suggest people that use meth for a long period of time lose up to 10% of the neurons in their brain, and that does not come back. That's permanent damage. So amphetamines can be really dangerous, especially meth. Cocaine is a stimulant. Um, it is uh, a pretty expensive drug. Uh, use of uh, cocaine has been declining since uh, the 2000s. We saw a big incline on cocaine use in the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, it does increase alertness, improves concentration, mood elevation. Uh, it uh, elevates your um, central nervous system. Um, a lot of people that use cocaine are poly drug users in that they combine cocaine and alcohol. Little evidence to conclude that amphetamines directly cause people to behave violently, but they do increase the likelihood that an already prone person will behave violently. So people who already have kind of a predisposition for aggressive or violent behavior, if they take some of these uh, stimulants, particularly meth, um, that can increase their violence. Crack cocaine. Um, crack cocaine is uh, is kind of a, the the lower end of uh, cocaine. So it's it's cocaine mixed with other stuff to make it uh, less expensive. Persistent crack users are often again poly drug users, meaning they use other types of drugs. Crack use by itself does not appear to cause violent behavior in normally non-violent behavior. But again, if we have somebody who is already aggressive or prone to violence, this could actually increase their, um, their violence. And of course, with all of these drugs, the production, distribution, and selling of any of these drugs has been associated with violence. So it's not just crack or amphetamines. All of these drugs, the production, distribution, and selling is associated. The business side of any drug is associated with violence. MDMA, these are synthetic drugs, uh, meaning they're man-made, so it includes things like ecstasy or molly. Uh, use has increased uh, starting in the late 1990s. We saw them being popular in clubs and raves at music uh, festivals. They increase energy, euphoria, emotional warmth, empathy towards others, a distortion in sensory perception. Um, they, do have, uh, they do have negative effects on some people and can even cause death. Narcotic drugs, we have uh, natural narcotics, which meaning they are uh, made from um, uh, natural products like poppies. Then we have semi-synthetic nar narcotics, which are partially made from natural um, and then partially made from uh, man-made. And then synthetic are completely man-made drugs. So heroin um, is derived from the poppy plant. It is a central nerve uh, nervous system depressant, meaning it can depress your breathing and respiration. It also causes mental clouding, um, contentment. Uh, it, there is definitely a relationship to money producing crime with this one, and uh, heroin is highly addictive. Uh, fentanyl is similar to heroin, heroin in its biological and psychological effects, and fentanyl mixed with heroin typically has deadly consequences. Um, a lot of heroin is cut with fentanyl, and uh, and we see a lot of uh, deadly overdoses with that mix. Now, OxyContin and Vicodin are both prescription pain medications. They are narcotic drugs. Um, the most prevalent and widespread abuse of all opioids and prescription drugs in the United States. Uh, this is a big issue. I don't have to tell you guys that um, here in this country. Um, what happened, you know, a few years ago, when particularly when Oxy came out. Um, you know, Oxy was touted as being a non-addictive drug, as um, being a painkiller that would last for a long period of time. So you didn't have to take, you know, a lot of painkillers all day long if you had chronic pain. And a lot of people took this drug and got addicted. Um, well, now our, all of our pharmacies and state laws have really 
uh, you know, have really clamped down on um, writing prescriptions for these types of drugs. So a lot of people that um, became addicted have now turned to street drugs like heroin. So really has caused a, a, a big problem here in the United States with addiction and crimes associated with addiction like pharmacy rob robberies, burglary, theft, fraudulent prescription, healthcare fraud, et cetera. Um, some of the club drugs, these are uh, these are typically man-made drugs, ketamine, GHB, and rohypnol. Uh, ketamine, by the way, is a horse tranquilizer um, used in uh, used by far, uh, by veterinarians. GHB and rohypnol are are synthetic drugs that have uh, hypnotic compounds. Uh, you've probably heard of these as being called um, uh, date rape date rape drugs. Uh, GH ketamine is, uh, again, was developed as an am animal tranquilizer. It causes mild feelings of euphoria and kind of an out-of-body feeling. It is used to make MDMA. GHB is a pleasure enhancer that causes a quick state of intoxication. It's often used in date rape, date rape and sexual assault because um, uh, people don't have a memory of what happened the next day. Rohypnol, rohypnol um, is actually a sleep medication that is used in a lot of countries. It causes men mental and physical incapac incapacitation, and it's another common date rape drug because people become incapacitated and they have no memory of the events later on. Alcohol is the substance that's most widely used by teenagers and a lot of adults. Um, you know, alcohol, a lot of people don't realize alcohol is a uh, depressant. Um, alcohol does uh, lower GABA, which is responsible for your inhibitions. So, um, and and in, when you first start drinking, it can kind of raise your energy level, but eventually, um, if you keep drinking, it does become a central nervous system depressant. It does lower your inhibition, so you might do things you might not otherwise do. Um, some people who are prone to aggressive behavior, uh, verbal or physical aggression, when they start drinking. Um, their their inhibitions go down and their aggression goes up. So some people actually become really violent when they're drinking. Alcohol is responsible for more deaths and violence than all other drugs combined. And alcohol is another one of those, you know, really, um, you know, really difficult uh, uh, drugs because alcohol is legal here in the United States. If you are over the age of 21, it is a legal substance. Because it's legal and it's such a, you know, it's so socially acceptable, um, we don't have kind of the same negative perception of people who drink that we do for people that use um, something like heroin or who are addicted to um who are addicted to uh, opioids. Uh, so, so it's an interesting one. The psychological effects of alcohol in low doses, again, it can act as a stimulant, um, giving you more energy, uh, you know, making you the life of the party, if you, you know, so to speak. But in moderate and high quantities, it is a central nervous system depressant. Um, and because of that, um, not only does it lower your inhibitions, but it, you know, and, and depress your central nervous system, you can overdose on alcohol and you can die from alcohol poisoning. With alcohol and crime, approximately one third of all offenders who commit violent crimes were drinking at the time of the offense. And I already mentioned that some people who are prone to aggressive or violent behaviors become even more aggressive and more violent when they are drinking. Um, there's little, a little evidence that alcohol or drug use cause violence in adolescent offenders. Um, we never want to say that using a drug or alcohol causes criminal behavior, um, but it definitely contributes to criminal behavior. Aggressive and violent behavior in childhood generally precedes the initiation into drug and alcohol use for juveniles, especially in boys. Um, there seems to be kind of an orderly sequence of substance abuse where young people have problems at home, problems with peers, all of those red flags that we've already talked about in previous chapters. They start experimenting with drugs and alcohol. It kind of changes the way they feel. Um, it might be part of their social group. And um, that, sub that experiment leads to substance abuse and then later addiction. Um, all right. So if you have any questions about anything in this chapter, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day.